themselves. Okay, so um, welcome uh, to uh, the OKC Colloquium for today. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Carl Fields. Uh, normally I would start with something like Carl got his PhD at, but uh, Carl's one of those people who you, you have to go much earlier than that in an introduction. So, so well before Carl even started his PhD, he was really well known in the, in the Mesa stellar evolution community uh, for studying massive stars. And even so much that, you know, before he was a PhD student, I already thought he was a PhD student uh, at Arizona State where he did his bachelor's. Uh, but then he did move on to his PhD uh, at Michigan State and where he is arguably is one of the world leaders in, in studying multidimensional core collapse supernova progenitors uh, and progenitor modeling, which is what he's going to talk about today. And he graduated last year uh, from Michigan State with his PhD and is now a Feynman Fellow, uh, distinguished fellow uh, at Los Alamos. And um, thanks, Carl, for, for giving the talk today. And we really look forward to it. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that great introduction. Um, and I'm excited to be here and, and sort of share the work that I've been uh, working on and, and some of the things that I've been interested in lately. Um, I'll apologize, apologize in advance. I'm on a two sort of monitor setup here, um, which is why you see two names on the Zoom call. So I'm going to try and bounce between uh, looking at this machine and this one as my slides are on the right. Um, but today I'm going to be talking a bit about um, what I title, you know, for, for these proposals and so on. Uh, the next generation of uh, next generation simulations of massive, the remarkable depths of massive stars. Um, and so I'll kind of go through and talk about what that looks like and some of the different sort of um, details that we're considering and trying to get closer to the correct answer when we're looking at uh, how these stars may end their lives. And so I like to start off with uh, an introduction and kind of sort of set the roadmap for where we're going uh, in this talk today. Um, and so I'll start off talking generally about core collapse supernovae. Um, I'll talk about the explosion mechanism or one of them um, one of the main ones that we sort of focus on and that we sort of uh, try to encapsulate with the different types of input physics and uh, different method methodologies, uh, a lot of which Evan's con concerned with in these simulations of <clears throat> stellar explosion. Uh, and then I'll sort of present some open challenges, some problems uh, in modeling core collapse supernovae and some of the ways that we've been trying to address them with some of the simulations that I've been doing um, <clears throat> and how that folds into the, to the, to the general picture. That'll lead me into talking specifically about these 3D core collapse models where progenitors, I'm talking about the stars that will eventually become the explosion or eventually collapse, uh, and then they may explode or implode. Um, I'll survey sort of a landscape. I'll talk about multiple massive star 3D models that we have, uh, as well as a new uh, 3D rotating um, progenitor model, uh, which we just recently published uh, last month. Uh, and highlight some of the results from that model that's sort of opening new, even more new questions, um, particularly about angular momentum that we hadn't um, thought about uh, previously. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about some of the signals that we might get from core collapse supernovae, whether it be gravitational wave or neutrino emission, I'll talk about that briefly uh, and sort of set the landscape for um, some of the different ways that these new progenitor models can, um, can impact these, these different signals. <clears throat> Uh, so core collapse supernovae, right? Um, so maybe I don't have to argue too strongly about how they're important to different areas of astronomy, but um, some of the ways that I like to think about them having an impact uh, is galactic chemical evolution. And so we're talking about nuclear synthesis. Um, stellar feedback is, is a very important way that they help sort of uh, evolve these galaxies over time and, and, and play an important role uh, in that. <clears throat> as well as compact object formation, right? And so they produce neutron stars or stellar mass black holes. Uh, and so understanding sort of the different properties of these compact remnants that come out of these simulations and matching those to what we expect for population studies, uh, as well as just um, observed properties of, of these remnants is something that's very important to understanding core collapse, uh, the explosion models themselves. Uh, and then something that's, you know, very, uh, very important especially right now with this combination of um, advanced gravitational wave detectors uh, and low energy neutrinos. Um, <clears throat> when you can couple these different um, observations, you can actually 
uh, look to actually extend this, uh, this horizon in which you can sort of detect these by combining, um, you know, light, light and, gra and gravitational waves. And so there's a lot of interesting uh, open questions in that leveraging these core collapse models that can sort of allow us to move further and, and go beyond uh, what the individual detectors themselves uh, might be able to do. Um, <clears throat> in general, we expect about uh, three per century for a Milky Way type galaxy uh, for a core collapse supernova explosion. So uh, pretty rare events. Um, they liberate a ton of neutrinos. Um, and, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity so, to sort of detect them. And I'll talk a little bit about that, how that's being done and combined with uh, gravitational wave emission. Uh, they're very energetic, so on the order of one beta, so 10 to the 51 ergs. Uh, and they're produced by stars with about eight times more mass than, mass than the sun. And so that's what I'll sort of be referring to when I say massive stars. So uh, depending on uh, who you talk to, if they're a stellar astronomer, they might say um, something a little lower mass than that. But here we're, we're um, referring to stars that will, um, you know, certain uh, due to some input physics uh, in the 1D models, there's a range where they might uh, produce iron core masses. And so that's something um, we're using to sort of signify what we mean by massive stars. Uh, and so how do you explode the star? Um, so the standard picture, at least one of the pictures that we uh, like to think about stellar evolution is, you know, these massive stars will burn heavier and heavier elements, um, kind of like this onion model, which is uh, maybe not that accurate, but maybe one of the most simplistic ways to show um, this evolutionary <clears throat> pathway of the massive star, where you have the most dense or the, um, the, the heaviest nuclei in the center, and then you have the, uh, the ashes or the remnants of these, um, of these shells on top of that, where the star has gone through subsequent burning stages to eventually form an iron core in the center. Um, so eventually you'll form that iron core where this iron core is inert because you can no longer fuse uh, heavier elements. Uh, and so eventually, once it reaches sort of a critical mass, that mass will become gravitationally unstable um, because pressure sources are sort of being removed. And then you'll sort of, um, you'll have the start of the end of the life of the massive star where this core collapse will, will proceed rapidly. Uh, and so getting into more of the details of what that looks like, you can then sort of focus on that iron core and say, how do you get from a collapsing iron core to exploding a star? And so I have here sort of a, a, a diagram or, a circle and keynote um, signifying this iron core. Uh, it has some properties where Ye here is the electron fraction, uh, slightly neutron rich, it has some central density uh, and some, some radius. Um, that core collapses uh, on the time scale of about a few hundred milliseconds. So it happens very rapidly. Um, and then what sort of happens to sort of halt that is it reaches some radius um, and some sort of uh, critical density where it just sort of halts, it, it, it bounces, it reaches this critical point, uh, and that bounce is actually very important because it signifies the beginning uh, of the end, really, uh, for this massive star. And it, at, at this point, it has a different radius, it's, it's much more compact, um, and then it's very neutron rich. And so during that bounce uh, portion, what happens is uh, that bounce sort of launches a, a shock outward from um, from the, the surface of this, this, this new core, this, this proto-neutron star, um, or this, this very nascent um, compact remnant in the center. Uh, and that core actually launches a shock, right? And so that, that, that shock moves outward. Um, but eventually, um, that shock loses, loses energy. So it's not actually energetic enough to promptly explode the star. And so in sort of some of the early work that folks were looking at sort of this, this idea of the explosion, um, there is a sort of mechanism, the prompt um, explosion mechanism, where it's like, okay, well, can you actually drive an explosion in that way? Turns out that the, the shock will eventually, um, for many different reasons, lose energy as it travels through time, uh, uh, through, the, through, the, through the star. And so then now the question is, how do you go from bounce, where you sort of launch this shock, uh, to the phase that we sort of, um, or to, to this phase that we know should happen, where the, stock, the, the, the shock eventually stalls, uh, so this stalled shock phase that happens around uh, 100 milliseconds, um, and actually something that we realize in our simulations, where here I have on the right a, uh, a slice from one of um, 3D explosion simulations that uh, Evan, Evan was um, involved with uh, and, and led, um, where in the center we're showing that iron core, or proto-neutron star now, um, 
it's emitting some neutrinos out and then you have sort of this dotted uh, white line around it where this the shock is sort of stagnant it's sort of um, equilibrium it's, it's not moving out um, at this particular epoch it's just sort of stationary sort of being um, it's being uh, balanced by sort of the infalling material and then the pressure behind it um, at this stalled shock phase so it's something we realize in our 3d simulations but the question is how can we continue to drive that shock outward to successfully unbind the star as we know stars do explode um, and so I like to think about, um, and actually I'm going to pause here to see if there's any questions on that particular um, portion of the talk or, or any uh, previous slide. Um, I can't really see the chat, but I'd be happy if, if someone wanted to unmute their mic, if they had a question or drop it in the chat. And... Okay, uh, no questions? Cool. Um, well, I'll stop a few more times uh, just to see if there's any other questions, but um, but yeah, so the question is, how do we sort of drive this stalled shock to lead to a successful explosion? Um, where I have a diagram here on the right of that proto-neutron star in the middle again. And so this time a more uh, schematic idea of how can we tap into some of that energy from that cooling neutron star that's, um, that's contracting uh, to revive that shock. And so what happens is, as that proto-neutron star contracts, you can actually absorb some of the neutrinos that are emitted behind that stalled shock and actually use it to heat up the shock and drive successful explosion. And so this is something um, known as the delayed neutrino heating mechanism, neutrino-driven convective um, explosion mechanism is a lot of words for it. But uh, this is the, the general idea that sort of builds the foundation for how we understand and how we, um, how we model these simulations uh, of, of these stellar explosions. And so, uh, it turns out you only need to tap into a few percent of the neutrinos released, so um, it can be pretty efficient in that way. And so uh, this is kind of the picture that we we look at in terms of um, how we how we drive explosions in most massive star models. Uh, and this sort of brings us to sort of this era of three D core collab uh, core collab supernova explosions, where I have some of my uh, favorite volume renderings here uh, uh, on this slide. Where in these different volume renderings, we're looking at uh, we're visualizing specific entropy. And so this is a really good tool to sort of visualize the shock morphology or how the shock moves out. Uh, and so in the center of a lot of these, if you look closely, you'll notice that you see the proto-neutron star, um, sort of that, that heating source, if you will, where we're absorbing some of these neutrinos and that neutrino, those neutrinos are helping drive convection and drive a shock uh, and successful explosion in some of these models. A lot of these models differ in the different initial physics, like in the top right. Um, and this is actually a rapidly rotating model um, and magnetic model as well by Philip Mosta in 2014. Um, but all of these different simulations take different, very important pieces of, of physics into account, all of which um, have different uncertainties. So um, general relativity, how you treat neutrino transport, uh, and then even the microphysics, you know, what is your stellar, what is your equation of state? Um, and how does that play a role? How does that qual qualitatively potentially alter your results? Um, so one of the, some of the open challenges uh, in modeling core collapse supernovae um, and you know, some, some of the things that folks have been looking at uh, is you know, sort of the, some of the challenges that, that were shown in some of the work, in the work that uh, Evan, and, Evan and Sean uh, Couch had from 2018 were, uh, they map in this 1D initial model. So they start from a stellar evolution code uh, and then they evolve it sort of to the pre-supernova stage right at the point of collapse. They map that into sort of one of these very large codes that is able to produce simulations like from the previous slide. They have all their um, choices for input physics and um, the treatment for neutrino transport and so on and, and gravity. But you get a situation like what sort of was shown on the right where I have um, now a volume rendering, a, a movie still of entropy, so we're trying to sh uh, track the shock morphology, but you have something that starts out um, spherically symmetric. Um, you can see sort of the proto-neutron star in the center. Um, some convection sort of starts to move up, things get moved around. Um, the edge of that shock is sort of denoted by this cyan contour that if you sort of follow it by eye, you notice that it contracts a bit. So this would be the stalled shock phase. Um, eventually there's some shock uh, sloshing that sort of takes place. Uh, this is the instability that's been talked about previously. But eventually what happens is this model that has seemingly all of the pieces of input physics uh, and sort of state-of-the-art uh, 
ingredients for a successful explosion model uh, eventually fails to explode and that shock recedes. Even the sort of sloshing, which is actually a pretty rare instability, is not able to revive the stall shock. And so the question is now sort of, um, we seemingly have all the pieces, what are we missing? Why is it in this model that we expect to explode? Um, what, what is it that is potentially not being captured accurately or um, is failing from, from sort of our assumptions? And so this is one of the open challenges that's sort of motivating us to look closer at these 3D core collapse models. Another thing you can kind of look at uh, and things that folks have uh, looked at in the past is um, even when you sort of explode the model, um, as I'm showing here on the right, I have T minus T bounce in seconds, which uh, if you recall from the previous slide, uh, bounce were sort of the start of the explosion time. On the y-axis, we have the diagnostic uh, energy and units of beta on a log scale. So it's kind of confusing, but qualitatively, I'll say that um, most of the models, uh, or at least the one that sort of asymptotes, which is the sort of the light green line, reaches 0.1 beta. Um, and so you recall earlier, I said most will have energies around a beta or so, um, or around 10 to 51 Hertz. And so there's this challenge where even in this large grid of 3D explosion models as shown on the right, those that start to sort of asymptote, or if you sort of take the derivative, because these haven't really reached sort of uh, their plateaus in terms of the energy, they're seemingly much lower than we expect for uh, these explosion energies where around 0.5 to even 4 beta for some of the most energetic models is something more in line with what, um, for instance, work by Dan Kaysen and Stan Woosley in 2015 suggests that we would have for these type 2 peak um, sort of typical uh, massive star explosion models. And so not only are we having challenges with exploding them um, sometimes, but now we have this challenge where even when you robustly obtain explosions, you may still be missing a piece of the puzzle because now these energies are not reaching what we expect from uh, other models or from, um, from observation. Uh, and I'd be happy to stop here again uh, and ask if there's any questions on, on sort of what I've, what I've discussed so far. Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, cool, so we have some sort of open challenges with, with these models uh, now and, and, and there's that, that only, uh, points at two of them, but there, there's a there's a handful more that folks have been concerned with. But um, what are the some of the different solutions that people have have been interested in and in, in seen potential pathways to solving sort of these challenges? And so one of the things that folks have been thinking about is uh, how do you treat gravity, right? And so, excuse me. So if you make an assumption about gravity, so you assume it's um, a Newtonian potential or something in your code because it's much easier to sort of have that than a fully uh, relativistic, uh, general relativistic hydro code, um, what sort of effect does that have? And so folks have found that if you use a full GR hydro code, you can get more compact neutron, proton neutron stars, and that actually can lead to larger neutrino luminosities. So more heating terms, um, potentially more energetic, maybe that's part of the solution. Um, how you treat neutrino transport, that's very challenging to do. Uh, and there's different approximations for that, but folks have found that you can get qualitatively different results and maybe the combined um, use of sort of a more sophisticated neutrino transport scheme um, plus general relativity uh, can result in explosion and, and maybe get, get us closer to the answer. Um, on the right here is a ball and rendering from a work by Luke Roberts in 2016, um, where they actually did this. They, they combined some of the state of art tools um, with multi-group uh, neutrino transport uh, as well as um, general relativistic gravity. And they were able to obtain a robust explosion in their fully 3D model, as opposed to some of the other approximate models. So potentially uh, the answer, or closer to the answer, uh, as one might expect. But one of the things that I want to focus on um, for the rest of this talk is the initial model um, and those perturbations in that initial model. Uh, and so if you recall from our first movie that I showed, uh, that model sort of started off spherically symmetric, where uh, that proton neutron star was very, um, spherical, which it is in most cases, but um, it just started out as uh, entropy being sort of a shell sitting on top of uh, the proton neutron star. So um, I like to argue that most pre supernova models or massive stars near collapse are probably not spherical. And so um, there's been some work sort of trying to identify how not spherical they are um, and how that might affect the, the explosion mechanism. Um, so yeah, so some of the uh, early work or um, 
yeah, I, I guess you could say early, it, it seems recent, but it's 2015, seven years ago now, um, was by Sean Couch in 2015, where they actually evolved a 3D massive star model in um, one eighth of the, the full four pi. So they sort of approximate it by only looking at an octant. But what they wanted to do is take this model a few minutes before collapse and, and evolve it and, and see how much these different um, convective regions that exist outside of this iron core before it collapsed, how much they differ from sort of the angle average um, approximation that we make when we import these models usually to explode them. And so um, here I have sort of slices of their model where we're looking at the uh, magnitude of the velocity um, where we have the iron core in the center, above that's a silicon shell, we'll we call our sort of onion model picture from the beginning, and then above that's the oxygen shell. And so what they see in time from left to right uh, is that you can get speeds of on an order of about 500 kilometers per second in that silicon shell region um, where T equals uh, 155 is the start of iron core collapse. Uh, and so this is pointing at, okay, maybe we're missing not only the non radial structure of the convective regions near collapse, but also the magnitude of these velocities and how they might impact the explosion. Um, and so what they did was sort of 3D octant model, and they also took an angle average of that and they exploded it because they wanted to quantify what that impact was specifically. Uh, so here we're showing on the x-axis T minus T bounce in seconds. On the y-axis, we have the angle average shock radius again, uh, where their 3D initial model is shown by this cyan line, which has a much higher, more energetic, a more prompt explosion. Uh, and then the 3D angle average model, which is this yellow line, actually uh, maintains much lower uh, and then explodes at a later time and is less energetic. So pointing at one potential way that these models are, are not only helping potentially explode um, in, a, in, a, in a potentially otherwise failing model, but now they're also more energetic. So push, pushing us um, closer to um, maybe an answer to one of these open challenges. Uh, there's been other work by uh, groups like Bernard Muller's group in 2016, where they took this, they sort of relaxed the assumption about the four pi, and so they evolved the full um, 3D model, the full sphere. Um, they actually excised the core in this model because it wasn't um, uh, very convective, and, and the iron core is very hard to treat in 3D. Uh, and so they 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 ran these models where they're focusing on oxygen shell burning, where on the left they have silicon 28 mass rate fraction sort of uh, tracing the effects of oxygen shell burning. And on the right, we have radial velocity. Uh, and so now we're seeing even much larger um, speeds in these simulations near collapse, where they evolved to, I think, the final seven minutes or so before collapse. So extending the evolution time and also observing that we're seeing very large scale dominant flows in these shell regions near collapse that, that could also not only um, help drive explosion, but can change what the shock morphology might look like as you evolve um, that model through bounce and then eventually explode it. Uh, and so that's actually the next step that they did where they took these models, they say, okay, we have our 3D progenitor that we evolved. We have this 1D angle average uh, model, which is sort of um, akin to using just a 1D initial progenitor as has done in the, been done in the past. Uh, and then qualitatively, what do we get? In, uh, that's what we're showing here, where we're looking at specific entropy again, where we're trying to map sort of the shock morphology in these 3D models, um, where these are 3D explosion models. And on the left is sort of the, the results of the 3D initial progenitor, so a very asymmetric explosion, um, shocks at larger radii. Uh, and on the right um, is very similar to, say, if you took sort of a slice of the movie that we showed earlier of the failed explosion, um, where this started out with the initial 1D progenitor. And so, you could argue that there might be some sloshing going on, but even so, this um, the shock radius is at much lower values. And so painting the same picture that these 3D progenitors can help re um, successfully revive the shock in some cases, but also lead to more energetic explosions. And so some of the questions I like to ask and sort of motivating my work is, how do these 3D progenitors help facilitate explosion? Uh, and so some of the ways, um, are the Mach numbers. So if you have in these progenitor models, these 2D and 3D convective progenitors uh, near collapse, if you have large scale Mach numbers, so um, a, a, a non-negligible fraction of the, of the local um, radial velocity over the local sound speed, um, that actually leads to larger density fluctuations during collapse. And so if you, if you observe these in these pre-supernova models, 
those can um, provide conditions that are favorable for explosion. Um, yeah, and also sort of um, what was been observed, at least for the, the, the model that Bernard Muller's group ran, where they evolved that um, 3D progenitor model and exploded it, they noticed an increase of mass in the gain region um, due to the non-radial flow. So stuff is moved around in ways that you wouldn't otherwise, um, or as easily otherwise ha happen if you started from a 1D initial model. And that actually leads indirectly to an increase in the heating rate. So recall um, something that helps us drive explosion is helping heat up that shock. And so that's something that they observed in these 3D progenitor models um, more so than the 1D equivalent. And then lastly, um, something we're also looking for is sort of large scales. So if you have sort of non-radial kinetic energy at large scales, so recall that sort of dipole moment that we saw um, from these progenitor models in, in the silicon 28 mass fraction um, for the, for the pre-supernova uh, epoch, that can actually also lead to favorable um, conditions for explosion. So all painting a picture of the pieces that we need um, to drive this successful explosion. Uh, and I'd be happy to stop here for any questions uh, as I move kind of to the next part of the talk. Okay. So this is all kind of um, motivating uh, some of the work that we've been concerned with lately where we wanna look at the convection in the pre-supernova model near collapse for a range of progenitors, right? And so we don't expect the internal structure for most stars to sort of be similar. Um, and so we want to sort of survey uh, the landscape of 3D progenitors, if you will. Uh, we're on the right. Oops. Uh, we're on the right. I show um, stellar profiles. So on the x-axis we have mass coordinate, um, which uh, here we're using sort of as a, as a as a radial coordinate, where a lower mass coordinate means that you're closer to the center of the star, um, and then uh, as you move outward you contain more of the star. Um, and then on the top, we have convective velocity. Middle, we have oxygen 16 mass fraction. And the bottom is a silicon 28 mass fraction. And these, these plots are pretty dense, but the main thing I'd like to take away is that if you look at sort of comparing the colors between these plots, um, you'll notice a range of different um, qu qu qualitative properties between these different uh, color lines where you, have, you may have one region that has a very large extended convective zone, um, for a particular model, and then the other one has a much more narrower one. And so we wanted to sort of survey the different sort of shell configurations that you might realize in a grid of, of massive star models in the moments before collapse. And so all of these models were taking, taken about 10 minutes prior to collapse. They were then mapped into Flash, um, stellar, the, the hydrodynamics code Flash. Um, and then we initialized these models in the way that's done previously with um, the work in 2015 by Sean Couch. Uh, and then we, we evolved these to sort of identify what their properties were. Uh, so yes, we evolved them for 10 minutes um, using an approximate um, reaction network. Uh, and so the results of these simulations I'm showing here on the right, where we have uh, as the time T minus uh, TCC, which is core collapse. And so this is starting about 500 seconds before core collapse, where uh, in these columns we have from left to right, silicon 28 mass fraction, radial velocity, and radial Mach number. Uh, and from top to bottom, we have 14, 20 to 25 solar masses as the initial um, initial mass for these for these models. Uh, and so you'll notice you get something kind of qualitatively different for sort of all of these models, which one might expect, being that the initial conditions were all pretty different. Um, but what we did find is that we see sort of large scale flows sort of happening in each of these simulations, where the the movie kind of stops right at the start of our core collapse. Um, but I'll point your attention to sort of the last column where we see sort of Mach numbers on the order of about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 in some of these simulations. So uh, we're observing that sort of key ingredient that we identified earlier as being favorable to helping drive explosions as it leads to density fluctuations that can be amplified near collapse. And so qualitatively already from looking at these models, we're seeing something that paints a, a very positive picture as these for input for explosion. Uh, qualitatively, we, we wanted to look at sort of what, of the, what does the convection really look like in these models. Uh, and so we, we ran a 14 solar mass model um, where here we're showing, and this is from the, the, the same grid of models, where here we're looking at the uh, magnitude of the velocity field where we have this uh, iron core in the center, um, and then we have oxygen shell burning happening above it, uh, and then a thin silicon shell below that. But 
Uh, mainly it's the oxygen shell that's very convectively active. You see the speed sort of increase as, as the uh, core starts to collapse uh, and the model stops. But we see Mach numbers are around uh, 0.04 for this model. This is actually one of the, um, convection was the weakest in this model, um, but even in Mach number 0.04, when you take into account these non-radial features and these, this broad range of convective scales, all paint a positive picture um, uh, for explosion. Uh, so one of the other things that we like we looked at for these models um, was sort of what did the shell sort of look like, you know, and and, how, and can we quantify different things uh, with this? And one of the things that folks have done with these oxygen shell burning uh, simulations is looked at things like mass entrainment. And so um, here I have a slice of the carbon twelve mass fraction uh, increasing in time from left to right, and then we have two of the same three uh, D models top to bottom. Where one uh, where they differ based solely on how the magnetic or excuse me the uh, velocity field was initialized, uh, and so what we wanted to do was sort of uh, quantify: can you get a difference in the mass entrainment rate um, based off how you initialize your model? And the reason that this is important is because um, if you en entrain much more mass or of a, a, a given isotope, in this case carbon twelve, you can actually alter. What you predict for um, the nucleosynthesis, which you, when you actually explode it, for this particular isotope, um, you know there's a work uh, previously a few a few years ago where they said that you can actually um, account for uh, the decrease of odd z elements uh, in your sort of uh, nucleosynthesis predictions when you have a very large mass entrainment rate. It, it was much larger than what we're observing here, but we're still observing that where um, a slight difference where I have the number on the bottom here. It's, it's, a, it's probably on the order of a few percent, um, but it's not negligible and it's something like this and you can sort of um, propagate that outward and lead to a different picture of what we might expect of how much uh, fuel might be mixing into the different burning shell region where I'd like to argue that sort of this top right panel uh, is mixing a lot more fuel down uh, into the oxygen shell of carbon um, than, than the model the equivalent model below it. And so um, a, a detail that sort of came out of these models, but one that has implications for nucleosynthesis uh, and is maybe painting a more complex picture of these 3D progenitor models um, that we might have otherwise not have, uh, thought to look. And so uh, this is something interesting that we saw come out of this work. Um, one of the other things that we want to do to leverage these 3D models is say, you know, how well can we actually um, inform the 1D MESA models. Um, you know, we, we start with MESA, uh, stellar evolution code, and we want to say, okay, well, we can't sort of evolve the entire star in 3D for, you know, the, the lifetime of the star. Can we maybe um, evolve for the final 10 minutes or so, like we've done, and then inform MESA and say, hey, we expect convective speeds or so to be larger by this factor or something. Um, and so what we did was we compared these sort of angle average profiles uh, on the right here, again, where I have mass fraction on the bottom, or uh, excuse me, mass coordinate on the bottom. Um, so again, kind of a radial coordinate. And on the top, we have convective velocity. On the bottom, we have Mach number. Uh, and so the color of the lines don't really matter other than that I'll say that um, most of them match, which is great because these are different approximations we made for this grid of models. Some are octet models, some are at higher resolution. But in general, um, that first sort of hump for the silicon shell convective region uh, and the second hump for, for the sort of oxygen shell region match um, qualitatively in most of the models for the, uh, for the, for the, the convective speeds as, as well as the Mach number. Um, but the 1D model, which is the green line here, um, and I'll sort of describe it as well, um, is, is the model that shows much lower convective speeds as compared to the other models. And so arguably in, in most cases, we actually underpredict the um, convective velocity speeds in the MESA models, um, as well as the Mach number um, as a consequence um, in the oxygen shell region, which is the second outer region. Uh, but in the silicon shell, you can match it sometimes. So it looks like there's this sort of complex case where you can actually, in some cases, match the MESA model quite well. In other cases, you, you can't. And so there, there might be room for potentially um, modifying or enhancing um, the convective velocity speeds um, to sort of match what we predict from um, from from the three simulations, and so um, I'll stop there before going into the next region. See if there's any questions um, on what I've talked about so far.
Yeah, I guess I have a question about that. Um, so, I mean, is it clear what, uh, why you have larger convective losses? I think there's a lot of um, reasons why, but I think that um, the main reason is um, you can realize a broad range of convective scales in 3D, whereas um, whereas uh, in one D, as I understand it, with mixing length, you, you have like one sort of fixed length, and 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 so you you miss a lot of uh, the cascade, I guess, if you will, um, the spectrum of the of the of the speeds. And then it's also the case that with these oxygen shells, you tend to find that the turnover scales will sort of go all the way out to the entire um, extent of the scale, which is why you can have a broad range. You can have very large scale and um, smaller scales. And so I think that's a big part of it. Um, and then also just, I, we found that sort of the uh, confective efficiency, if you will, is just much more efficient in 3D where you can have the nuclear burning become more efficient um, in these shell burning sources where in 1D that's, that's, um, that's not what we're really observing. So I think those are two of the bigger bigger reasons. And were those, were that, was that oxygen shell a different size in, in the 3D? Yeah, yeah, and that's something we looked at too. And I, I've done the um, exercise in the paper, but um, you have a freeze out of convection actually happen um, earlier in Wendy based off of the local um, properties of the, the profile where sort of that convective region will recede inward, which is why you, if you notice that that 1D line um, was, the extent was much more inward. And so it's it's maybe not um, the best sort of comparison to do right at core collapse. If you were to take those these models and compare them maybe say 100 or 50 seconds before core collapse, you might get an oxygen shell region that's more in more agreement. But it is the case that freeze out of convection happens much more quickly uh, in 1D than 3D. And so that's, that's if you're taking your 1D core collapse models and then you're, you're mapping them into your hydro code, you know, you're gonna have a potentially a, a big difference in the oxygen shell region that you, that you argue is there convective wise. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Um, so one of the next things I want to talk about uh, is what about rotation? And so uh, we recently um, put out a paper on, um, the 3D evolution of a rapidly rotating 16 solar mass star. Um, and so here I have an even more uh, busy uh, plot from as, as, com as I showed previously. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I, and, and I don't want you to look at this in any detail, but the, the one thing I want to sort of point out is that this model is, um, is pretty generic. It's a, it's a 16 solar mass model. This middle panel um, shows the angular momentum sort of initial profile where we have these sort of jagged, uh, sort of transitions between different shell regions where the sort of um, region around 1.8 to say three uh, solar masses signifies the convective oxygen shell region according to MESA. And uh, that's gonna be important because we're gonna see this sort of gradient in this angular momentum sort of uh, change significantly when we evolve this in 3D. And so um, pretty generic model has an iron core. We evolve it um, from, with 350 kilometers per second um, equatorial velocity at the zero age main sequence. So it starts out pretty high velocity and then sort of redistributes over time that angular momentum. And then we follow this for the final 10 minutes uh, to core collapse. Uh, so I'll qualitatively, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show what sort of the results of this uh, simulation look like. I'll try not to skip the movie. Um, but yeah, so here we're realizing uh, neon, the, the neon 28 mass fraction where we're doing a volume rendering of it to sort of trace how things are moved around and again in this oxygen shell region, which is that main sort of convective region for this model. Um, so we have the uh, iron core in the very center. Um, this sort of pink or red contour in the center actually denotes the edge of the silicon shell region because for this particular model, the silicon shell region wasn't very convective. So everything below that, um, is, is mildly or, or, or non-convective. And so we're focusing mainly on the oxygen shell region above that, um, which is spinning around. Again, the star is rapidly rotating, but, but we'll call it this oxygen shell is pretty extended. So it might not be as obvious that it's rotating um, unless you look very, uh, very closely um, at some of these sort of um, neon 20 fuel being, being mixed around as a result. 
Um, but we're still realizing sort of broad convective scales as we did with our non-rotating model. Things are just being sort of stirred up a bit. Uh, again, we're seeing mock numbers that are not negligible in this simulation. Um, that's something that tends towards favorable conditions for explosion. Uh, and so one of the main results that we got out of this paper is this really, um, is this plot on the right where we're showing again, the x-axis, the mass coordinate, y-axis, we have the angular momentum profile where I'll draw your attention first to the dotted line, which is the 1D initial condition from the MESA model. Um, and so we see these jagged sort of features that we saw from our plot from the previous slides. Um, and then so we also have these shaded regions which denote where the model is convective uh, when it's mapped in the flash. So again, I, I mentioned that there was a very narrow, weak, uh, so it can shell that convective region, which is that innermost region. Uh, above that is a pretty extended convective oxygen shell region. Um, and what happens is when you take this initial model, which is shown by that dotted line again, uh, and you evolve it in 3D, you get something like the result, uh, which is the solid line, where these jagged sort of angular momentum regions actually lead towards something that is much different um, than predicted by MESA. You get a, a, a smoothing to um, you know, some order of magnitude of a constant value in the convective region for the oxygen. Um, so you get something that differs significantly in the oxygen region where there's very large uh, convective eddies uh, occurring. And then in the silicon region, it's a little bit different. It's, it's not as drastic as in the oxygen shell, but it still leads to something that's a little bit different than what MESA predicts. Uh, and then so if you, you, know, you sort of pick a mass coordinate and you integrate inward, um, you could argue that uh, in some cases, you might get a, for a different initial progenitor model, you might get something that leads to a significantly different interior angular momentum profile. And so that's very important because um, folks will tend to use these results um, and actually integrate inward and sort of predict what the proto-neutron star mass spin is. And so if you can realize a 3D simulation where you get significantly different angular momentum transport interior to that, you can get a, a, a spin estimate that differs significantly from what you would uh, get from MESA. For this particular model, because the silicon uh, shell convection was so weak, we get something that agrees well with MESA in 3D, which is, which is great because um, then sort of uh, validates using sort of the 1D profile. Um, but that might not be the case for all initial progenitor models. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and a lot more questions to be asked about the, the transport of angular momentum within massive stars um, at the point near, near core collapse. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. We did sort of uh, look at some of the um, flux components that were contributing to this uh, transport of angular momentum. We quantified those. Those are in the paper as well. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, though, in the interest of time to talk about some of, some of the other results that I have here. Um, and so one of the last things I want to talk about was core collapse uh, supernovae using 3D progenitors, right? I've talked about it most of this talk, um, but haven't showed uh, many explosion models. Um, and so one of the works that we've been working on, um, and I, I keep updating the year on this uh, in prep paper, <laughs> but we, uh, is a project we have where we wanted to look at um, one, two, and 3D explosion models um, using these 2D and 3D progenitors, right? So sort of taking it from an end-to-end -end pre supernova to explosion phase, um, self-consistently using the flash code um, as well as MESA and, and, and look at what those results are. And so on the right, I have on the x-axis post-bounce time again, so starting from the point of explosion. And on the uh, y-axis, I have the angle average shock radius. Um, so I'll point your uh, attention to sort of the different groups of lines uh, where these are the two 1D simulations where the difference between them is that one's from a MESA model. So you can imagine maybe more um, stark sort of um, sharp gradients in the different profiles. And one is from an angle average uh, of a 3D model. And so even with these, you, you notice a slight difference uh, in the explosion times in these models. Uh, and then I'll point your attention to 2D, where 2D is pretty similar. So this 2D, again, starts with a 2D progenitor model uh, and then a 1D angle average model, where only a slight difference is observed. These, they both kind of qualitatively look similar in the, in the explosion um, or the shock morphology. Maybe the blue line has more um, dramatic sort of oscillation about this, uh, about the axis. Uh, and then the bottom line is the 3D model that is looking like it's about to um, experience sort of that revived uh, stalled shock phase and, and successfully explode. Uh, I'll show the results uh, or sort of a movie of this 3D uh, simulation we have uh, that's sitting somewhere um, on, on a tape disc at Argonne National Lab where 
uh, we have sort of a slice again of this um, entropy. We're trying to look at the shock morphology. Uh, and then recall this is from that 3D initial progenitor model. So we're looking at um, what is the result of having these sort of perturbations accrete onto that proto-neutron star and help revive stalled shock, where it looks like in this sort of uh, this movie here, we're starting to see some oblateness to the shock and potentially observing shock run away as it successfully revives. Um, so one of the things that's really interesting about this is, um, you know, you can get gravitational wave emission out of these models, even in the non-rotating case. Uh, and then so one of the things that I pulled out of sort of, um, you know, paper, uh, one of Evan's papers is very interesting. Uh, and something we're thinking about with these progenitor models is what is the impact of these perturbations on things like the gravitational wave strain? Uh, and so here I have gravitational wave spectrographs where you can have on the x-axis bounce time again, y-axis is frequency. Um, and so you see a slight, a slight peak in the sort of excess of the, of the strain uh, as this proto-neutron star cools and that frequency character frequency goes up. Where on the left, we have the 3D explosion model that produced this uh, that did not have perturbations. And on the right um, is the same model, but in, they actually imposed perturbations to the simulation as it was collapsing. And so sort of in, in between of using a fully 3D model, you can just sort of characterize those perturbations and then apply them to your explosion model. And what you find is they actually lead to uh, producing a broadband excess of gravitational wave strain emission um, once the different shell regions are accreted onto the proto-neutron star. So this is one way we can tie that into um, gravitational wave emission um, and, and, and how these models also impact uh, some of the signals that are produced in these explosions. Uh, and so we see this for our 2D simulation. Recall we had two 2D models where one is started from an angle average 1D model. The other one is actually from the 2D collapsed all the way down. We see this slight excess where here we're showing um, the gravitational wave strain at some characteristic distance on the y-axis. Uh, we see a slight excess when that silicon shell is accreted, even in the 2D uh, models. So one way that we can start to um, potentially provide more um, self-consistent gravitational wave emission predictions um, as well as sort of uh, seeing how these uh, models can help revive these stalled shocks. Um, so this is the last slide I'll share where I'll just sort of say, um, sort of place it in the context of things like um, advanced LIGO and CAGRA. Um, so their, their sensitivity bands are on here. And um, this is from a grid of 3D rotating explosion models where each sort of different color line shows you where they would lie within these um, these, these noise curves, so they are detectable <laughs> at 10 kiloparsec. Um, but if you have a situation where you can also um, have some coincident detection with something like low energy neutrinos, you can actually push that horizon distance out to say 60 kiloparsec or something. And there's, there's been work that have shown um, the details on how to do that, but that's sort of where we are um, in terms of what we'd be able to predict in terms of gravitational wave emission. Um, from these explosion models uh, here. And so um, I will move past my summary slides and get to some of a looking forward, uh, hopefully as a, a starting point for, for any questions that folks have, but um, we're thinking about magnetic fields, right? I talked about a lot of different things, but I didn't mention magnetic fields very much. Um, those can be um, very important uh, in sort of how the topology is sort of realized during collapse or in the pre-supernova phase and how that leads to field amplification during collapse and explosion um, because we know most uh, massive stars if they're slightly rotating they could potentially have large-scale magnetic fields that's something we're very interested in as well uh, neutrinos i mentioned them very briefly but there's also this um, potential for sort of pre-supernova neutrinos that we can predict with these 3d models and that's something that i'm, I'm really interested in starting to think about uh, how we do that with, with sort of the data that we have and, and where that can have an impact. Uh, and one of the last things I'll mention is um, we talked about angular momentum transport quite a bit, or, or I did it in, in those slides where, um, you know, it's, it's sort of starting to go against what is assumed in these 1D models. Um, it, it sounds like the case is very complex in terms of how angular momentum sort of transported, but those can affect our predictions for these compact remnants whether it's spin or the angular momentum contained inside, which can have an impact on whether a model explodes or implodes if it forms a disk. These are all very important questions that we can start to realize with these 3D um, rotating models uh, and something I'm um, excited to work on in the future. So 
Um, with that, I will end um, and open up for questions. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate everyone uh, moving the talk back for me to, to accommodate the time zone. So. Thanks, Carl. Okay, so while people get their questions uh, together, let me ask one about the angular momentum distribution. So, so the stellar evolution model assumes constant omega. Is that right in convective zones? Yeah. So, so is that just completely wrong? Well, so it's I actually gave. Um, I, I talked about these results recently at a at a workshop at KATP, um, and Matteo Contiello was there, and actually I, I believe that he's done some work on realizing the situation where you assume uh, constant angular momentum in in the region, right? Um, and so. I think it turns out that the case, the case is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> it's probably sometimes lit tends towards constant angular momentum, sometimes constant um, omega, because um, these shells that you'll get in these models will all be different and they'll have different things that sort of contributing to them. So I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, it's just sort of the context that you're thinking. And the, the challenge with, with 1D Mesa models is that we sort of assume the same thing throughout, um, but it might be more beneficial, at least for these advanced stages, to maybe assume constant angular momentum because that's that's where our 3D was showing. Mm -hmm. So it's so wrong sometimes. <laughs> Klaus, go ahead. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, some possible observational implications. I mean, there's been some discussion about uh, generation of uh, gravity waves in connection with these last burning stages by uh, Shield and Quartet and others. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, where, do you see anything of that or can, can you sim simulate it at all? I mean, that's, uh, that would uh, then lead to mass loss uh, when these waves are propagating out of the surface. Yeah, um, I have thought about the internal gravity waves. Um, if I, if I understand the, 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 the question correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the challenge with these is that, um, so that would typically require a radiative zone between the shells. So if you have to say like the silicon shell region is very convective and very excited, um, a radiative region above that, and then the oxygen convective region above that. And so it, it, it's possible that you would get some damping of those waves as they traverse, even if they are realized within that radiative zone, they would be damped. I don't know by how much, but they, it's possible that they'd be damped to where they wouldn't really, um, when they do reach the surface, it's quite weak. Um, and so I'm not sure how much it could play a role uh, in this particular case, but that the thing is, is that there's so many different sort of configurations that you can get for these, these um, 1D conditions as you then map them into 3D. So I think it, it is possible. Um, I, I don't think it's been anything that we've realized significantly uh, in our models, but I've been working with folks um, asking, say, hey, do you think there's internal gravity waves here? Because um, uh, Philip Edelman's actually um, working uh, at Atlanta with us, and, and I, we've had a lot of conversations about the models that I've been running. Uh, and something, it's something we're certainly interested in. I just don't know how um, how much it'll be showing up in the models we have. Mm, okay, so I don't think it's possible. Thanks. Thank Any other questions out there? So, so the oxygen shell simulations that you're doing, looking at the entrainment, was not um, not at core collapse. It was before or some some point. Yeah. So that was. I think that snapshot was like um, a couple hundred seconds before core collapse, and so. Um, we did notice some sort of mixing of that material into the oxygen shell and uh, it differed based off of which sort of characteristic L you chose for how you initialize the, the spherical harmonics for the initial velocity field. Um, and so, I, you know, we, we wanted to look at that because folks, at least in the field right now, it's kind of just like um, you choose an L and then you start out and then just kind of go with that or you just let it initialize from the, the grid, um, sort of the grid uh, effects. Um, but I guess I, we're trying to argue that maybe that is something that can lead to some, an impact on a quantity that we know is constrained to some degree, right? So if you have very large scale entrainment, you know that you're not producing this much with these certain type of isotopes, 
And so maybe that's arguments for maybe don't use such a large jail or something. And so I think it was good to sort of as a first step or um, sort of a, a check a check post, if you will, um, to say, hey, this is the entrainment we're observing. Does this agree with observational data? And we were in that within that range that agreed. So, um, but there's things like folks have observed. So I think Bernard's done a, um, a simulation three simulation where they observe this sort of oxygen neon shell merger, and they have this very large sort of production of these different things um, that they otherwise wouldn't observe. I'm not sure how common these shell mergers are in these 3D progenitor models, um, but that's another way we can use nuclear physics potentially to constrain, okay, well, such a scenario would overproduce certain isotopes. Um, and so how common are these, these merger events? We don't know. Chris, do you wanna go? Sure, thanks. Um, I, I know you focus on the very ends of, ma of uh, massive stars, but can you speculate a bit on how, um, so the uh, rotation is an important thing for, oh, we know a lot of massive stars rotate quite quickly throughout their lives. Um, do you, can you speculate a bit on how uh, different stellar evolution is in 3D for, or if we did stellar evolution more correctly in 3D, how that would affect, sorry, I'm not doing a good job articulating this question. But how can you speculate a bit on how more generally um, the poor, uh, or to what extent? Sorry, I, I'm having a, I'm, a, I'm doing a robust job. Um, oh, it's about, so maybe the, is the question like how how well um, will we need to do in three D to sort of uh, change potentially yeah. the earlier evolution one D models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, just thinking in that sense in general, it it turns out that like. Um, the, the 1D models do pretty well um, for a, a good portion of the, the evolution of the star, depending on what you're looking at. And so folks have done things like, um, you know, helium shell flashes, carbon, carbon shell burning and stuff, and looked at these different epochs. Um, and you are missing out still on these non-radial features of the convective velocity speeds. Um, but it just depends on what is the most important thing for your problem, right? And so uh, mm. there's been a lot of work in incorporating um, things like internal gravity waves into 1D models. And, and so you can have these multi-D simulations, realize these effects, quantify them, fold them back into a 1D model. There's been a lot of work on that. Um, but I think it really boils down to what your particular problem is concerned with. Um, for us, we know the non-radial perturbations is very important. So it's that's why even if we take these models only 10 minutes before collapse, that can still have a, a large quality. Mm. Um, but yeah, different evolutionary epochs, um, MESA's or um, star evolution codes are, are pretty pretty spot on with, with a lot of things. And, yeah, and even, I do, even when they're not, you can fold in other pieces of physics and, and, and make them um, a little more closer to what it's to. Okay. Yeah, I do, I do some observational work on uh, in, look, in, in uh, star clusters looking at um, measuring rotation rates of stars and comparing uh, 1D models uh, to the um, to what we observe, and and you obviously you, you do the models do seem to do well, but they're not perfect. Yeah, and and you know like the question with uh, that I haven't had earlier, you know, like the assumptions that are made for the angular momentum transport, they will change at each epoch, and so for your particular ep epoch, they might be sort of okay, and and I think that's what folks have done because a lot of times folks have um, tried to calibrate to observation when they can and when they're sort of choosing these parameters, and so they do match um, a lot of things. Um, but things like the deep star interior, these different convective regions, that's where we would expect them to fail. And so it's making sense that um, mm -hmm. it, it's from, from what's being assumed for the advanced epics uh, of, of these stars' lives. But, but yeah, I think even in the case where your models might be uh, earlier in, in, in the evolution, it's good to start, start, um, start to sort of ask these questions of, okay, it assumes constant omega in this region or constant uh, J in this region. How does that affect my results? And because you can realize different um, qualitative results um, by changing those assumptions. And so I think it's good to always kind of question these 1D models or even the 3D models. <laughs> I, I guess there's also a thing where um, you make assumptions about modeling rotation that might work well at low rotation speeds. But if you have a star rotation rotating very quickly, those assumptions likely start to break down. 
Yeah, yeah, you can have some dependence on the, the rotational velocity. Um, I haven't looked into that in particular with the 1D models, but I know that, um, for instance, it, just it comes to mind, I know in massive stars, um, if you don't have, um, if you don't have magnetic torques from um, things like um, sort of the sprut taylor dynamo that's slow, sort of slowing the core down as it's being spun up um, after it leaves the main sequence, you can get to rotational speeds of this core that can differ significantly from um, what we expect from like um, pulsars and so on. So um, there's a lot of different sort of input physics that have been included in these 1D models that if you just don't include or something, you get something that's maybe different. So. Cool, thanks. Let's nice talk. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, oh, Luba? Yeah, hi. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. Found it more than interesting. Um, from what I understand, you do have some um, plans and maybe thoughts about longer term simulations, right? If so, if so, how far do you think mass and flash can take you in that, into the timeline? And in comparison with 1D simulations, what would you maybe expect to see? What would you be looking out for uh, having your like, existing experience? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we're, it, and so for at least the pre-supernova phase, um, capturing sort of the silicon oxygen shell burning, um, I'd say there's not much further we can push it back. I mean, we can go to um, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, I think the main goal for that is just capturing enough turn turnover times in the oxygen shell. And because those can sort of vary in width so much that 10 minutes can very much be enough for one because we can get a, maybe, I don't know, 10 to 20 over uh, turnovers. Um, but for other simulations, we need, we need much longer. So I think it's mainly capturing enough turnover times for a given initial model um, for these for this particular thing we're trying to capture. Um, but I think for like other sim, like other evolutionary epochs, so like carbon burning, carbon shell burning, I think we would need to meet, uh, simulate much much longer. Um, but I think it's possible with flash. Um, we would just have to probably make some more different approximations. Um, but then that could be folded into like, okay, we expect the velocity to be this for Mesa during carbon burning and so on. Um, so I think it's um, more so that we want to focus on specific epics and pieces with Flash and sort of tailor it specifically to that problem. Um, because if we try to do sort of too far back, then we might be missing some of the things based off of the assumptions we're making about our initial conditions. So, so I think 10 minutes right now is, is pretty good enough um, in terms of the overturns, but you can always do better. It's going to be a big challenge when we want to um, include magnetic fields because you need some time for those fields to wind up. And so that's going to be a, a really big challenge. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, I think that's it because I don't see any more hands. So let's thank uh, Carl again. Thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you. I appreciate everyone having me. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Carl. Of course, yeah. I'm glad. Um, I'm glad I could finally make it. I know my schedule was really bad in the fall, so. <laughs> no, it. Uh, it's fine. It worked out good. Yeah. Cool. Well, it was good seeing you. Um, yeah. Take care. Yeah, we'll see what happens with that uh, access. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I might just sweep it under the rug or something. And <laughs> see. Right. See ya. Okay. See you later. Bye.